The Pacific Ocean is the largest ocean in the world, covering more than 30% of the Earth's surface. While oceans are directly important for the hydrosphere, atmosphere, and biosphere, something associated with the geosphere lurks beneath. Let's get into the Earth science behind tsunamis. On December 26, 2004, one of the deadliest natural disasters in recorded history struck. Triggered by a massive undersea earthquake with a magnitude of 9.3 off the west coast of northern Sumatra, Indonesia, a tsunami rapidly spread across the Indian Ocean. The powerful seismic activity displaced a vast amount of water, generating a series of colossal waves that radiated outward. The tsunami waves traveled at extraordinary speeds, reaching the coast of 14 countries, including Indonesia, Thailand, Sri Lanka, India, and others, within hours of the earthquake. The impact was devastating, with waves reaching heights of up to 100 feet in some areas. Entire coastal communities were inundated, causing widespread destruction and a loss of life. The human toll was staggering, with over 230,000 people confirmed dead and millions more left injured or displaced. The economic cost of the disaster was in the billions of dollars and left a profound impact on the affected countries. Nearly seven years later, on March 11, 2011, a magnitude 9 earthquake off the coast of northeastern Japan unleashed a massive amount of energy, resulting in a sudden upward thrust of the sea floor. This displacement of the ocean floor generated a tsunami that traveled at high speeds across the Pacific Ocean. The waves reached the Japanese coastline, where they rapidly grew in height, with some towering as high as 133 feet. The 2011 tsunami caused widespread destruction and a loss of life in Japan. Entire communities were flooded, and the disaster resulted in the deaths of over 15,000 people, with thousands of more injured and missing. In addition to the immediate human toll, the tsunami triggered a nuclear crisis at the Fukushima nuclear power plant, adding to the complexity of the disaster. While both were separate events, they both have stark similarities. In this week's episode, we are going to review why certain regions around the world are most affected by tsunamis. First, we'll discuss how a tsunami wave is generated. Next, we'll discuss which regions are most at risk from these waves. And, towards the end of the video, we'll come up with some solutions on how tsunami prone areas can prepare for the worst. Before we begin, if you enjoy learning about geography and earth science, this is a channel to watch. So be sure to subscribe to my channel, Our World, Our Planet, Our Home. Let's get started. Geologically, there are three types of plate boundaries. Faults that separate tectonic plates. Divergent, Transform, and Convergent. Divergent plate boundaries are where two tectonic plates separate from one another. Transform plate boundaries are where two tectonic plates slide past one another. And convergent plate boundaries are where two tectonic plates converge with one another. If under the ocean, all the types of plate boundaries can cause a tsunami, but the majority occur with convergent boundaries. There are three variations of convergent boundaries, continental-continental, continental-oceanic, and oceanic-oceanic. The continental-continental type occurs when two continental plates made of continental crust collide. A current example is the Himalayan Mountains, where the India subcontinental plate collides with the Eurasian plate. But here, since there is no water involved, tsunamis are non-existent. With the two other types, a continental oceanic and oceanic oceanic convergent boundary, tsunamis can occur here because at least one oceanic plate is involved. When a denser oceanic plate subducts, which means push under a less dense continental plate or oceanic plate, it can result in a sudden release of energy, causing an undersea earthquake and generating a tsunami. As the sea floor moves up, it pushes or lifts a significant amount of water above it. This displaced water forms a bulge or series of waves on the ocean surface. The initial wave generated by the sea floor displacement is usually very long wavelength and low in height, making it less noticeable in deep water. These waves can travel at speeds of up to 500 to 600 miles an hour which is much faster than an ordinary wind-generated wave. As a tsunami wave approaches shallow or coastal areas, the wave speed decreases, but its energy becomes concentrated. The wave can grow in height as it enters shallow water, leading to the characteristic tsunami wave that can reach enormous heights, sometimes tens of meters or even higher. 
When the tsunami reaches the coast, it can unleash a series of powerful waves that flood the coastal areas. These waves can inundate low-lying regions, causing massive destruction and loss of life. Regionally, tsunamis are most common where there are a majority of either oceanic oceanic or continental oceanic convergent boundaries. One area is ripe for this, a geological zone called the Ring of Fire. The Ring of Fire is a horse-shaped area in the Pacific Ocean Basin and part of the Indian Ocean Basin that is characterized by high levels of tectonic activity, including volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. This region is home to approximately 75% of the world's active and dormant volcanoes and experiences a significant percentage of the planet's earthquakes. The Ring of Fire is a result of the tectonic plate boundaries that encircle the Pacific Ocean, where several major plates converge, diverge, or slide past one another. One of the most notable features of the Ring of Fire is the prevalence of subduction zones, where one tectonic plate is forced beneath another. This subduction process leads to the formation of deep sea trenches, volcanic arcs, and seismic activity. Japan and Indonesia are two nations within the Ring of Fire, thus making both incredibly prone to tsunamis, as was seen in the 2004 and 2011 events. However, there are other nations very vulnerable to tsunamis. Another is Chile. Chile is situated on the southeastern side of the Pacific Ring of Fire, where the Nazca Plate subducts beneath the South American Plate. This subduction zone creates significant seismic activity, which can trigger tsunamis. Chile has a history of large and destructive tsunamis, such as the 1960 Valdivia earthquake and tsunami. Westward, the Philippines is prone to both earthquakes and tsunamis due to its location at the boundary of several tectonic plates, including the Philippine Sea Plate, the Eurasian Plate, and the Pacific Plate. The country has experienced numerous tsunami events throughout its history. The United States, which sits on the northern and eastern side of the Ring of Fire, has susceptibility to tsunamis. The state of Alaska, particularly the southern coast along the Aleutian Islands, is vulnerable to tsunamis due to its location near the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. Subduction zones and underwater seismic activity in the region can lead to tsunamis. Within the contiguous United States, the Pacific Northwest, including the states of Washington and Oregon, is at risk for tsunamis generated by subduction events along the Cascadia subduction zone, where the Juan de Fuca plate subducts beneath the North American plate. Now that we talked about the geology and regional geography of tsunamis, let's talk about how areas prone to them can prepare for future risk. The first step in tsunami preparedness is understanding the threat. Susceptible areas should invest in monitoring and early warning systems that can detect undersea earthquakes, the primary triggers of tsunamis. These systems provide valuable lead time, allowing authorities to issue timely warnings to coastal communities. Industrialized nations are the most prepared with this, as nations such as the United States and Japan have very capable early warning systems. The National Weather Service is the issuer of advisories and warnings associated with possible tsunami threats. Infrastructure is key to being physically prepared for any possible wave damage. Constructing tsunami-resistant buildings and strengthening critical infrastructure such as hospitals, emergency shelters, and evacuation routes is vital. Building codes should be updated to reflect these improvements. In terms of nations, Japan is the best prepared for this. Japanese tsunami walls, often referred to as tsunami barriers or sea walls, are extensive coastal defense structures designed to protect coastal communities in Japan from being devastated by tsunamis. Given Japan's vulnerability to tsunamis due to its location along the Pacific Ring of Fire and the historical occurrence of destructive tsunamis, the country has invested heavily in tsunami mitigation measures, including the construction of these massive sea walls. And finally, international cooperation is needed. Tsunamis can affect multiple countries and international cooperation is essential for preparedness. Nations in susceptible areas should collaborate on monitoring, information sharing, and joint exercises. International agreements can facilitate a coordinated response when tsunamis strike. In addition, poor and developing countries, with many being in proximity to the Ring of Fire, can receive added help from nations that have advanced protocols put in place. Ultimately, this will save lives. 
Tsunamis are forces of nature that can't be stopped. Geologically prone areas will see future ones, and even in the far geological future, millions of years from now, new areas will see them, since plate tectonics don't stay static. But, for the short term, prone regions must prepare the best they can for a future event. By implementing capable infrastructural projects and creating better early warning systems, all nations can be well prepared. That's the end of today's episode. Thank you once again for watching. If you're a nerd like me about geography and earth science, you'll love my channel. So please subscribe to Our World, Our Planet, Our Home to see more videos. Until next time.